I want to talk about that vision. You know, we've been using the past uh, Sundays to um, uh, focus on various values that as a church we will continue to press into. And uh, that uh, these are the things that are going to orient us as we do different things in uh, New England and as a congregation here as well. Uh, the governing values, one could say, of Congregation Lion of Judah. And one of them, the last one that I've touched upon, is uh, to be an evangelistic community. And I initiated last Sunday, did not get through it. The major portion of my meditation was be, uh, be, before me. And I want to continue with that because evangelism is important. And I think God is calling us more and more as a church to press into evangelism, to become an evangelistic people made up of individuals. It's redundant, but um, of individuals who are evangelistic in their outlook and in their style of life. You know, uh, uh, our vision should be around evangelism. Of all the different values, this is one of the key ones. Uh, I'm not going to say it's the, the, the central one, but really we exist to be evangelistic. And that, of course, has other things around it, like the other values that we have mentioned. But again, what is a vision? A vision is a unifying principle that guides and determines the various actions of an individual or an institution and that's what evangelism should be for us. It should be a unifying principle that guides everything that we do. If we seek revival, it's to give us the power, the anointing, the unction to evangelize effectively. If we seek to be a, a church that is based on the Word of God and that honors the Word of God militantly, it is because we know that without the Word of God as our foundation, we cannot be effective in doing evangelism. If we um, invite people to live a consecrated life, given totally over to the claims of the kingdom of God is because we believe that only out of a consecrated life can emerge the kind of effectiveness to speak the word of God to unbelievers boldly and convincingly, unless you are completely uh, immersed in the calling of being a believer, a disciple of Christ, you will not have the authority to be contagious and to bring others to Christ. On and on and on. So in a way, evangelism is really at the center I'm going to speak soon about also the, the call to, you know, being a church that, that is involved in the community, that seeks justice in the biblical way, in the biblical way that the Bible presents it. Uh, and, but, if, you know, in order to do that, we need to be saturated with the way that the Bible and the kingdom sees social, social justice. And when we, we minister to the homeless, when we work on behalf of immigration, we are doing it in a biblically founded sort of way. Um, in a spirit-filled, fully consecrated sort of way as an evangelistic outreach. So everything is around evangelism. We saw last Sunday that Israel was um, conceived by God to be precisely that, an evangelistic community that would uh, share God's character and the values of God's kingdom with the tribes that were around Israel who did not believe. But Israel um, mismanaged its calling and instead of being light, it became darkness. It allowed the darkness to wrap it um, around itself, and it, it squandered. Later on, when they uh, abandoned idolatry, they became self-righteous and uh, exclusive, and they saw their knowing the true God as a kind of a badge of distinction. And they looked at all the other people as Gentiles, which was a despective, a kind of a derogatory term. And they kept the light to themselves, as so many of us and so many churches are wont to do. We come to church, we have a great party inside the four walls, but uh, we do not play the role that Jesus has said that we should be, salt and light, contagious in the earth. And so God, as he will do, since Israel did not fulfill its mandate and its calling, he gave the calling to a people who are not a people, says the Bible, the Gentiles, the outcasts, and he has called the church not only to inform the nations about Jesus Christ being the Messiah and the source of salvation for themselves, but also uh, even the principalities and powers, the Bible says in the book of Ephesus, in the letter to the Ephesians, it says that we are supposed to inform the principalities and powers, those very demonic forces that seek to wrest 
worship from God and give it to themselves. We're supposed to, with our life, with our proclamation of the message, let them know who is the true God and who is the true Messiah. And so even in, in that sense, and if we don't do it, if we do not uh, um, assume and embrace the call to be evangelistic, then God will, get, will find somebody else because he will not have his gospel be put under a bushel. And that's what Jesus said when they rebuked his disciples when they were worshiping him as he came down on Palm Sunday from the Mount of Olives. He said, hey, if they don't worship me, if they don't proclaim my greatness, the stones themselves will do. God will find a way. But God willing, the church will not let him down. So we, lifted, we left it there last Sunday. I, I just want to emphasize one more point that is important is that in order to make an apologetics sort of, of, um, of uh, evangelism, that means, you know, to, to prove the importance of evangelism and to validate it before you this morning, uh, the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of the Messiah is closely linked to bringing salvation and light to those in darkness. If you see Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, you see that, um, you know, the, 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 the Messiah the promise is going to bring light in, dark, in the middle of darkness. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So the very essence of the Messiah is to be light and in the middle of the darkness. Luke 19 uh, verse uh, 10 speaks about the same thing. I'm not going to be following, trying to uh, follow the verses here in the Bible just to, if you can f put the next one down um, uh, quickly. Luke ch chapter 19, verse uh, 10 speaks the same way. If you can keep up uh, ahead of me, that would be great, Marlene. Uh, Luke 19, 10 says, um, while they were listening to this, he was... Um, like 1910, yeah. Today, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what Jesus came for. So you see that in the Messiah's very DNA, his ministry, his calling was to seek and to save the lost. So that's, a, that's an important thing. Prepare Matthew 28, please, at verse 19. You know, and Jesus Christ trained his followers and left them the specific task of preaching the gospel. That is the great commission. Matthew 28, 19. I'll just follow up from here then if we can't. Uh, Matthew 28, 19. Um, Jesus, on his last words before ascending to heaven, all authorities in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. And surely I'm with you always for the very end, to the very end of the age. So again, it is um, the, the, the last um, words that Jesus leaves his disciples is, you know, a commission to go and preach the gospel. Let's prepare Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 1 and following. And you, we see that Jesus' um, ministry was around uh, preparing those that would succeed him when he left. And so he spent much of his ministry training his disciples, sending them out just like we did yesterday, you know, sending people out. We know that the context is different, you know, in the 21st century. It's not as easy to do it in an agrarian society with different cultural values as it is to do it in the 21st century. But as I believe as an exercise in faith and in aggressiveness and so on, we send the people out as well. And God does move in that way. Mecha, can you give me the, the, the water, please? I, I hate to be just uh, wasting water by opening one over here. Thank you. Thank you. So, again, he sent them uh, two by two on training trips to exercise that call. And you see here, the Lord sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So, you know, these, these uh, things were registered in the Bible so that we, yeah, that's good. Just put them on there. They can read it. Um, so that we would um, learn how to do evangelism. He wanted to kind of uh, sear into our consciousness the need to be aggressive. So he, he trained them, and he says, you know, we ought to do the same thing. So now we go on to another uh, passage, uh, Acts chapter 4. 
Um, what, what was the vision of the first believers? So we have seen the Messiah uh, prophesied as bringing light to darkness. We see Jesus himself owning that call. We see him training his disciples and using precious time that he was here on earth uh, in his public ministry to, to get them to practice and to use the gifts of the kingdom for evangelism. What was the vision of the first believers in the book of Acts, for example, those first century believers, how did they see themselves? Because they're an example to us as well. They're a model for us to follow. These believers knew that their main commitment was to preach the gospel. They knew that that was their DNA, that was their vision, that was their reason for being. In Acts chapter 4, we see the disciples being arrested and, uh, and the, uh, the Jewish authorities are threatening them because they feel threatened that this Messiah that they have asked to be crucified is now being proclaimed and he is being believed by many, many in Jerusalem. So they forbid them to preach the gospel. And what do they say? Um, next, next verse, they forbid them. And, they, and here we see Peter and John, two of the leaders of the movement, it says, uh, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. Next verse, quick, uh, verse, not, verse 20. Let's just keep it moving because people see it quickly and they, they, will, they will read it very quickly. As for us, we cannot help speaking. Wow. Can you say that to yourself in your own life, is this true, that you cannot help speaking about what you have seen and heard? Hold, hold one, one moment there, thanks. Uh, can, can you say that? I mean, can you truly, can I say that, that I am so enamored of the gospel, that I am so possessed by the message that God has given me, that, you know, I just can't hold it back. You've seen that, that uh, comedy, uh, you know, this guy, uh, I don't remember his name, but he, you know, he's got to talk and he can't, he can't hold back words. He's a liar and so on, but he's just like, he can't, you know. This is, uh, this is what um, we should be like. We try to hold it back, but we can't. This is what the prophet said. You know, there was a fire in my bones. I tried to hold back the word of God, but it was impossible to do it. Uh, can, can we believe, can we say that, yes, that is my conviction, that's my situation. I got to go to a psychiatrist because everywhere I go, I just got to, I got to speak the gospel, no? We cannot help speaking about what we heard, what we have heard and seen. In verses 29 to 31, uh, the, the disciples are, are in a moment of great exaltation and praising and worshiping, probably in a home gathering. And they pray, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Next verse. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That is the, the, the mission statement of the church right there. Lord, give us boldness, stretch your hand for signs and wonders, and send your Holy Spirit into my life that I might proclaim your word with great effectiveness. So they knew that their main commitment, their main calling was to preach the gospel. Secondly, as far as these believers, their vision and their sense of mission came because the Lord himself had imposed it upon him. It came from the, Jesus himself, as we saw. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we, we see that Jesus says, you know, and again, um, uh, ch 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 Acts chapter 1, verse 2, that's all right, skip to the next one. Um, we see that Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem until you have been endowed with power on high. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This, is, this may be a, another version of the Great Commission. But here is Jesus. His sneakers are ready to be set on fire as he ascends like rocket man to the heavens. Maybe that's irreverent, putting that image about Jesus. But uh, he's ready to go. Angels are just waiting to lift him up to heaven. And this is what he's telling his disciples. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they, this, they, this was imprinted into their spirit before Jesus uh, leaves. That's what your calling should be. So they, their mission, vision came from the Lord himself. Here's another point. The clarity 
and the focus of their vision and their conviction that they had, that this was they, what they existed for, it gave them total success. It made them extraordinarily effective. The fact that they were focused on evangelism, uh, the, their conviction that this is what God had called them for. And they knew exactly, I think the church these days is too distracted. We have too many things on our plate. We expend our energy doing all kinds of things, having great programs, great parties, uh, great special effects, uh, lots of potluck suppers, and, um, you know, uh, all kinds of entertaining things that uh, distract from the main focus and uh, that kind of confuses as to what the nature of our true calling is. These disciples, they knew exactly what their focus should be. And this is why, for example, Paul... Paul uh, says, you know, I know I have been called to minister to the Gentiles. That was his focus. You know, uh, he loved his people, the Jews, but he knew that God had commissioned him to be uh, an apostle to the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Romans, the other nations. And that's why he traveled and he did what he did. He, he wasn't going to be distracted by other pieces. Peter, on the other hand, had been called to be an apostle to the, um, the Jews, the Hebrews, and he, he put his emphasis on that. These people, they were like pit bulls. They had laser-like focus, and they knew what God had called them to do, to minister to the lost, and then even further, to minister in specific ways. They, they knew what their mission was, and we should also, my brothers and sisters, you should know that the reason for being of your life and my life and God is putting a new sense of urgency in my heart. Uh, and this is why I share this with you. I've known for a while now, but this is coming to a head, that uh, the next stage of uh, Lion of Judah's uh, life, after we finished building these buildings, was going to be filling these buildings with people who have come to a saving knowledge of Christ, making these buildings a place for evangelism, for harvest of souls, for revival, for preparing and training others in New England to do the work of evangelism. And that's what we are seeking to do. And I think we are reaching another point of this, this development where it is clear to us, this is what we need to be doing. And we need to be using our time and our energies and our money to do that. And you guys, all of us, we need to become pit bulls for evangelism, sharing the gospel, inviting people to uh, come to the Lord. You know, that is what makes evangelism uh, possible. I do believe, by the way, I believe in street evangelism. I believe in, you know, uh, distribution of tracts. But I'm telling you, my conviction is clear that the way the gospel is going to be spread is by, by contagious believers, full of the Holy Spirit, convinced of their call, sharing the gospel wherever they are. And if the devil doesn't like it, that's his problem. You know how many, we have a lot of covert believers in Boston we have a lot of, um, you know, doctors and lawyers and the people in the health field and medical workers and uh, professors at the universities keeping the gospel under the bushel, behind, on, under the chair. They, they are afraid of uh, sharing the gospel, of praying for people, of uh, letting people know that they are believers because they're afraid of their jobs, they're afraid of their reputation, they're afraid of their professional future, they're afraid of being ridiculed, they're afraid of being unpopular. That is a lie of the devil. That is a, an in, that's intimidation. That's what it's called. These believers were not afraid to declare who they were. And we need to have that. We need to rebuke the spirit of timidity and ask the Lord for fresh boldness to announce the gospel and to know that this is what I have been called for. If I am not bringing souls into the kingdom, I am not doing what I should be doing. If my life is not being used of God somehow to advance the kingdom and to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ, I am somehow living the gospel inauthentically. And that, that is, a, I know it sounds really radical, but that is the truth when you look at the Bible, okay? Another, another uh, section here I want to open up. Let's examine the call to evangelism even further. And I already intimated some of these things. Number one, it is the reason for being of the church. Prepare John 15, verses 8 through 16, and 1 Peter 2, 9, uh, Marlene. It, it, the, the reason for being, raison d'être, as the French say. It is the reason for existing, the reason for, yeah, raison de ser in Spanish. 
It, it is why we exist. It is why we have been uh, brought into existence. The reason for being of the church, look at John 5, 15, 8. This is, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is why you exist as my disciples. In 1 Peter, don't be afraid to just take, take that one off and put the next one. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. What for? Why? Why are you God's special? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God called you from sin. God called you from darkness. Why? Just to give you a nice party and for you to go around celebrating, hey, look, I'm going to heaven. No, that you may declare the praises of him. Amen. In other words, that you may announce the gospel that you may share your testimony. The best way to be uh, a, a witness is just that. What did God do for you? You don't have to come with sophisticated apologetics about all kinds of historical things. That's good if you have it, wonderful theological arguments. You know one thing that people cannot argue with is what God did for you. Amen. He brought you out of darkness. He liberated you. He did something different. Amen. He forgave you. He gave you a new reason for existence. He reconciled you with himself. He took away the, the, the sense of guilt that you had. He gave you peace about where you are going and where you are coming from. He, you know that you are forgiven. Share that. That has power. Amen. Many times we confuse the, the simplicity of the gospel. We have lost that. So it is the reason for being of the church and knowing that we have been, that is why we have been saved. Evangelism is what we exist for and have been created for. And then uh, another, another thing, the reason for being, the fact, this is important, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to evangelize. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are to be used in evangelism. That's why they exist. The gifts are not just for us to um, kind of grow fat spiritually and to, you know, go around showing off with our healing powers and so on to display. No, these gifts have been given for us to do the work of God. Again, Acts chapter 1 uh, we should have it on. Acts chapter 1, forgive me for putting pressure here. Ch Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Um, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. One is the consequence of the other. We receive power to be witnesses. And uh, that's the way it works. It's not, the other, it's not the other way around. The gifts are meant to give us anoint, anointing, effectiveness, credibility, to call the attention of unbelievers to Jesus Christ. The, the signs, why are they called signs and wonders? Signs, what, is, what does a sign do? It points to something, right? What does the sign of uh, healing, of uh, uh, deliverance point to? Jesus. Amen. He's the source of them. So the gifts are given. You know, I, I think God, the, when we become the, the militantly evangelistic church and the people that we're supposed to be, God will be sending more of his signs and wonders into us. We say, Lord, give us signs that we might, yes, but sometimes it's the, what comes before, the chicken or the egg? You know, does he give you signs so that you can evangelize? Or do, as you evangelize, he gives you signs. It's both in a way. And the more you do, the more you receive. That's the way it works. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to evangelize. Uh, number three, when we evangelize, God sends his blessing, his support, and gifts to our lives. We've seen that already. But look at, uh, in a different way, Ma Mark 16, 20. Mark 16, 20. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Do you see the disciples going out and then the Lord confirming his words? Why is God going to bless with signs and wonders a church that is doing nothing? Just having an, in, an inner, inner party. He's not going to do it. But as the church goes and moves in faith, the oil of the machine will begin to flow and the signs will happen. So where there is a people, an individual, a church that is evangelizing, the signs will follow and confirm the, the work of that congregation. Um, another point uh, in John 15, verses 1 and 2. When we evangelize, we grow. The more we give, the more we receive. Okay? When we evangelize, we grow personally. 
You know, we experience God doing what he said he's going to do. We exercise the word. We exercise the message. And what happens? You grow as well. You grow in enthusiasm. Nothing more energizing than to have somebody come to Christ because of your intervention and your ministry. Nothing more inspiring. Nothing that validates more the word of God. Nothing that gives you more of a sense of authority. Nothing that enables you to experience the blessing of God in your life as well than when you <clears throat> bring souls to Christ. It's better than going to seminary, I'm telling you. As you evangelize, you grow in all kinds. You, you grow in the experience, in the use of God. God will then allow you to understand more about uh, spiritual warfare, more about um, the, the complexities of the message. When you have to use the message of the gospel and you're forced to do it as you evangelize, all of a sudden you're putting into practice the intricacies and the complexities of the gospel, and you're growing, you're exercising, you're growing in faith and, again, in authority. So Mark, um, uh, excuse me, John 15, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2, um, John 15, 1 and, and 2, verses 1 and 2, if I'll try to find it here. Um, it, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Okay, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Now, you can bear fruit. On, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. So you see this. Know that um, uh, when you evangelize you and bear fruit, God prunes you. God, God is then enthused by your life. And he says, you know, this person is rendering uh, progress, and uh, so I'm going to give them more. What does a great uh, um, executive, you know, corporate executive do? If he sees an employee that is bringing in money and uh, being profitable to the corporation, he gives them more responsibility. He sends them on training. Uh, he uh, encourages them. He uh, gives them a good bonus. Why? Because he wants that person to use their gifts more and more. That's exactly the way it works uh, in the kingdom as well. God will uh, bless you and you will grow as you um, uh, evangelize and you do things because the Holy Spirit will be sending more of its resources, of his resources into your life. Another point, so I've said, uh, the reason for being, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to evangelize. When we evangelize, God sends blessing, support, and gifts. When we evangelize, we grow and experience the blessing and approval of God. Here's another one. This is a negative one, number five. When we retain the gospel, we become spiritually impoverished. We become poor. When you hold back the gospel and you don't share it, <clears throat> when the power of the Holy Spirit for evangelism is not flowing in you and outward toward others, you diminish. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse uh, 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Um, maybe I'm missing something here. Uh, Marlene, put the, put the next one. If it's not the correct one, we'll go to the next one. Don't worry about it. Uh, just, just put... Forget about the first one. Go on to the next one. Nine six says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Of course, that is used for giving normally, and that is the intent of that passage. But it is a principle that evidently is applicable to every other area of the Christian life. If you, if you invest your life, if you are using your gifts... If you are using your time and your energy uh, for the expansion of the gospel, you will receive from God more. But if you hold it back, what does it say? Again, um, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 7, because the, the opposite, I, I think it is here as well. Um, yeah, if you, if you sow sparingly, you will also reap sparingly. If you don't invest your energy then you will, not, you will not get back from the kingdom. Salvation is free, but everything else is costly. Well, even salvation is costly. It costs the life of Jesus. But you know, yeah, God, God is a, there's a lot of stuff that God gives away for free. But one thing that he doesn't give away for free is a major blessing and prosperity and approval and power. It costs your investing. Many people, we have seen that in other ways. When, we, when I preached on Romans chapter 12, uh, it says about being, uh, living your life as a sacrifice to the Lord. It says, then you will confirm his per good and perfect will for you. It's only when you live the gospel authentically that you confirm, that you, you experience for yourself the promises of God and the blessing of God. If you're holding back, 
And you're being sparing in the way you sow, and that applies to uh, Brian's uh, uh, giving uh, meditation as well. You will receive from God in minor amounts. I think we're too comfortable. You know, this gospel of cheap grace that has been preached over and over again has neuter, neutered us for fruitful living. Some, this daddy that just gives, you know, without any expectations, that's not the Jesus that I see in the Bible. This Jesus that I see in the Bible is severe, loving but severe. If you advance his kingdom, if you obey him, if you do what he says uh, for you to do, he will bless you and he will advance you, he will prosper you. But if you don't, don't go to the party because you won't be able to get in. You have to put your money and your life where your mouth is. So when you retain the gospel, you actually sow and you, you harvest, you, you harvest uh, sparingly, the bare minimum. Here's another principle. The, this is the, the positive version of this. We experience the joy of the Lord when we evangelize. Amen. We experience the joy of the Lord. How many have experienced the joy of the Lord when they have brought somebody to church and that person receives Christ and you begin to see the change in their lives? I mean, there's no joy greater than that. Look at Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Psalm 126. Let me get there. Next time I'll be more prepared, but it's hard, I guess, to, yeah. It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Next verse, please. Five and six, verses five and six. No, verses five and six. Verse five. It says, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. It's a beautiful verse in the Old Testament. You know, many times when you, when, uh, you know, the, the Christian life is a life of uh, sowing sometimes and weeping. You know, I mean, God has given us a vision for what he's going to do in, uh, in New England. And, you know, for years, for decades, many of us have been serving the Lord, proclaiming revival. I mean, we have invested in our lives. And sometimes you don't see all the fruit that you want to see and that God has uh, indicated that you will see. And, you, and you know, you weep, you, you doubt you, uh, you agonize, but then you begin to see the blessing of God, and you rejoice. The disciples rejoiced when they come back, when they come back from those trips that the Lord uh, sent them, and they were rejoicing. He says, Lord, even the demons submitted to you. Uh, and, you know, you rejoice because you're seeing. Uh, every time I've seen the promises of God fulfilled in my life, I have rejoiced when I have invested hard. And I have expected him to bless, and he has blessed. So when you experience, when you evangelize and you see souls coming to Christ, you experience the affirmation, the favor, the pleasure, the approval of God in your life, and you rejoice. Many of us are sad, depressed, feeling unfruitful. It's because God is not using us more. And, and uh, we need to put into practice, we need to invest I'm going quickly here. I know I just don't want to have another sermon to preach regarding this because there's a, stuff, a lot of material here, but I want to finish at least and then have a couple of minutes for a couple of announcements. Number seven, we are accountable to God for the salvation of souls. The word here is accountable. We are responsible. Let's look at um, Ezekiel chapter 33, um, verses... Three, Marlene, put just the next one if you can. Don't worry. I mean, you know, don't hold on one, one scripture there. You know, put it, put the next one because that's the only way we're going to be able to, um, to do this well. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 33, um, verses 7 through 9. I'm sorry if I'm putting pressure on people, but uh, this is important. Ezekiel 33, verses 7 to 9. Um, it says that, you know, the famous passage, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out. 
to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, then it's their responsibility. They will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. And that's not just the Old Testament. You say, well, that's Ezekiel. That's the Old Testament. In, in the New Testament, you see the unfaithful servant being rebuked severely by his master because he took the gift, the talent that he had given him, and he put it under the mattress and did not use it. And the Lord calls him, you wicked servant. I mean, we don't like to hear these expressions in this sort of grace, cheap grace, the gospel that we are preaching. But I wonder how many of us will be judged by God. I don't know that, I don't, I'm not saying that we will lose our salvation, although I'm telling you, that we're, when we're in that territory, we're in very murky theological territory. Um, and I, I won't uh, get into that because it is very complex. But I don't want to run the risk of when I get to heaven, the Lord saying, you wicked, unfaithful servant. I gave you gifts, I blessed you, I prospered you, I put you in a strategic city in the world, and you simply took my blessing and you hid it, and you were more interested in the, pro the, the progress of your profession, in having a big house, and you know, having your cars, and having, being uh, promoted in your job, and you, did, you held back on my word. It is, we are accountable before God. This, this gracious, loving God is also a severe, expected God. And he makes us responsible for the gifts that he gives us. So let's not, let's not uh, take too many liberties regarding that. Here's another point that's really crucial. God has no other plan. God has no other plan except for his church to be the vehicle for the preaching of his gospel. It's not like he's going to send some archangel if we don't preach the gospel. He has made it clear that it is the church that will do the work. Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, verse, uh, verse 14 and 15. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, 14 and 15. How, they, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? You know, this is a question, a rhetorical question that God is asking. How can the unbelievers call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom, of whom they have not heard? How can you ask people to believe, or rather to, to worship God's name, to serve him, if they have not been informed of Jesus? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? You know, that is the, the agonizing question that God asks. And we, the church, have been commissioned to be that announcing church. God has no other plan. He has no other alternative, and we're going to die or survive and thrive on God's expectation that the church will declare the message. Prepare, please, Matthew 25. God will judge us. But by what we have done with his gifts. And that's part of the, I, I've already put that there, but let me just, I, I had put it as another point, but that's important for some reason. Let's isolate that. Matthew 25, verse 19. God will judge us by what we have done with his uh, gifts. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Read the parable of the unfaithful servant. And you see that they were giving different, um, different uh, talents. And, you know, the, my point here is that when Jesus returns, he will call us into account. And he will ask us, you know, what have you done on behalf of those souls that I put under your care? He will judge us. First Corinthians uh, chapter 3 also gives us another expression of that as well. Verses uh, 13 uh, through uh, 15. Their work will be shown, uh, even 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. 
if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. It's a mysterious passage, complex. Well, it is saying there, on what are you building your life? On what are you building your life? And, you know, I'm going to stop there. There's a lot of other stuff. And who knows? I may even continue with it. Uh, you know, Jesus is saying, or, or the Holy Spirit, you know, at the, at the end of time, when the time to evaluate uh, the worth of your work in, in life and God, and by the way, there will always be an accounting. Now, believers will be judged as well, the Bible says. But we will be judged not for salvation. This is what I think the Apostle Paul is clarifying here. But we will be judged on, we will be evaluated. There will be an evaluation of our life. And this is why when we see the complexity <clears throat> of uh, the other life, you know, we realize that this is not just as one-dimensional as we think we are, the, resur the resurrection dimension. Well, you know, we'll just all be handed one, uh, uh, what do you call that, a garment that fits, one size fits all, gray, and we're given a garment and we're given a harp to go in some cloud and play music the rest of eternity. What more boring image than that for, for eternal life? No, it's going to be a very dynamic thing. And we will be blessed according to what we invested here on earth. We will be evaluated. Some of us will get uh, a gold medal. Some of us will get a bronze medal. Some of us will get a silver. Some of us will get a wooden medal. And some of us will get probably just a little piece of carton to kind of put there so that we won't be completely bereft of any kind of reward to encourage us. But there will be de degrees of glory, of authority, of power. The afterlife is a very dynamic, complex dimension, my brothers and sisters. And how you use your gifts and how you invest your life and the foundation that you establish for your Christian walk here on earth will determine your degree of glory and of approval in eternity. You know, many of us are so content and complacent because we think, you know, all I need to do, I just want to get my visa stamped and I want to get in through the, wall, through the door of heaven. And that's it. Because after all, you know, it's pass or fail. It's not as easy as that. Depending on how you invest your life here on earth, you will receive degrees of blessing in heaven. And some of us, you know, we spent our lives, I was more interested in my own earthly pleasures, my own personal fulfillment, my own career, my relationships here, my body. I spent hours and hours honing and, you know, sculpting that body, and that's all I did. You know, reading books just to have a fat brain, and I wrote a lot of books that are in some library obscurely put into the basement of some obscure library, like Widener Library at Harvard, books that people never read. And somehow individuals spend hours and hours writing these things. And that's, that's all their destiny. That's all that they want to do. And they squander their lives. Why? Their foundation, the foundation that they're spreading for their future life is weak, straw, hay, wood. The Apostle Paul says, no, build your life on diamonds, build your life on gold, build, build your life on titanium, build your life on a solid foundation of investing for the kingdom. I mean, what more beautiful foundation than for you to say, you know what, I'm going to use this 70, 80 years of life here on earth just to advance God's kingdom. And when I get to heaven, then I'll reap the benefits. I'll reap uh, the interests for eternity. That's the way I want to live my life. Forget the books, forget uh, the accolades. I'm going to invest here, and then I'm going to reap when I get to heaven. I want to make sure that I, I found my life on gold, on something lasting, something that does not burn up here in, in heaven, doesn't get stained. Um, because many of us will be disappointed when we, we will be saved, he says. We will be saved again. The idea, the, this is so, so complex. The intimation is, you know, yeah, you may be saved. You will get in like, you know, just as the door is closing. You're going to have to go by the side to just sneak into heaven. Smelling like uh, smoke. Some of us will get to heaven like that, you know, just by the skin of our teeth. 
you know, we'll, we'll receive a grudging, all right, come on, get in. Instead of a come faithful and worthy servant, you have been faithful in the little things, I will put you in the great things. I, I want to receive a, 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 an enthusiastic welcome from the Lord when I get into heaven, okay? Because he, he's, he's going to be happy with what I invested. Instead of a grudging, you know, acceptance, passing with a, with a D yeah, or D minus. <laughs> you know, what are you investing your life in? What are you putting as the foundation of your life? I hope it is to be a fruitful servant of God. Amen? So just stand up. Let's, let's not bow. Let's not be pious. Let's stand up in a sign of uh, receiving this word. Would you accept the call? Would you accept the challenge? Would you accept uh, the, the um, uh, commission of Christ to be a servant of the living God, to be an instrument of Christ? Would you just uh, die right now? Would you take all of your goods and just cast them at the feet of the Master? Would you say, Lord, if I perish, I perish. I am lost. I am ruined for this life. And I want to live out the rest of my days being an instrument for your kingdom. And when I get to heaven, I'll enjoy then a few thousand years of vacation. <laughs> but I'm going to spend myself here. And I'm going to struggle and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to weep. And there will be moments also of great joy, let me tell you. There will be as well. But are you willing to pay the price are you willing to say you know what forget that uh, seven bedroom house that I've been saving for in that BMW I, I, I want to invest it in the kingdom of God I'm going to be a radical disciple of Christ would you say amen to that calling I, I, I'm saying it right here radically right now militantly would you would you commit would you commit would you commit and say Lord all that you have invested in me all the gifts that I have received, every intellectual uh, property, asset that you have placed in me, I'm going to give it back to you multiplied. I want my life to be an invaluable interest, uh, uh, instrument for your kingdom. And I, 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 I reject everything else. You ask me to take my money, my glory, my influence, to sell it all, to, 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 to give it away to the poor. The poor, those who do not know you. And Lord, I, I receive. Would you, would you accept that with me? If you want to raise your hand, if you just want to make a, a, sig a signal inside your, your body, whatever it is, but acquiesce. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Say, yes, Lord. I, I receive the calling. I commit to being an instrument for the rest of my life. I will be used of you. Father, I, we give to you every resource of this congregation, every chair, every square inch of carpeting. Lord, every inch of space, all that we have, we put it at your feet for the advancement of your kingdom and for the salvation of souls. And we will live for that, Father. We engage, we engage, we engage your calling. Now send your power and send your gifts so that we will be especially fruitful and, and we receive now a double anointing for kingdom advancement in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Say amen with me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.